Hey, how are you doing today? Good. Awesome. Well, who are you and what do you have for us? My name is Elliot Robbins and my company is called Connoisseur Stamps and Collectibles. And I'm so happy to talk to you today. I want to just share with you um, one of my collecting interests, something I'm really excited about and passionate about, which is um, Mexican philately, especially the first issue of Mexico, which is known as the Hidalgo issue. Miguel Hidalgo was kind of the father of Mexican independence. He was very instrumental at the beginning of the Mexican Revolution when Mexico um, fought to achieve their independence from Spain, which was achieved in 1821. Mexico's first postage stamp issue is actually commemorates this wonderful leader and father of Mexico, Hidalgo. And this, these stamps were from 1856. That's when Mexico went to adhesive stamps. And the first issue is about five or six stamps. This is actually stamp number one. It's uh, medio real, which is a half a real. In those days, uh, eight reals equaled one peso. So this was the lowest denomination. And what's so important about this issue for Mexico is that there were about 50 different postal districts that overprinted these stamps. In fact, in classic philately, Mexico is the only country that had overprints on its first issue. And so there were about 50 different postal districts and the um, the post office was, the main post office was in each one of those districts. So here what we see is an overprint. Um, these are from um, Chihuahua, which is a state in Mexico, but it was one of the 50 districts. And um, we see the Chihuahua overprint on this pier of number one. In addition to the overprint, we have a cancel. And this is a beautiful cancel. It's a small town. It's called Guadalupe y Calvo. And it's a town of about 5,000 people. And we see a portion of that postmark. So what, what the collector needs to understand is that there are so many ways to go with collecting the Hidalgo issue. You can collect issues that are overprinted from each of the 50 districts, and some of them are much scarcer than others. We all know that Chihuahua is a pretty big district, but some of them get very, very scarce because there were smaller districts. And then within each district, we have the town cancels from so many towns in each district. So there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of combinations if you collect used Mexico. Here we have another number one. This is a single, and this is from the Guadalajara district. We see the Guadalajara vertical overprint, and we have a bit of a stamp from a town, another small town. This town is called San Blas, and I believe San Blas is actually a port in Guadalajara. It's a, it's a town of about 10,000 people today. This is what the cancel looks like. We've learned this from um, the um, from the postal history books. We know what this entire cancel would look like. Here we have a portion of the cancel on the stamp. And then I also have another specimen here. This is also a number one. This is actually, I think, from Moralia. I can't tell you what the postmark is. Why this stamp is important is it shows its position. You can see a vertical line here and a horizontal line here. This was the upper right corner stamp on a sheet of 100 stamps, and we know this stamp to be position one by virtue of these lines. So you can also collect the different positions. Here we see a number two. This is a different denomination. This is a one real. It's a yellow stamp, and what we have here is a pier. And this pier is from Mazatlan. We see the vertical overprint Mazatlan. That's the district. And we see a lovely cancel, almost the entire box cancel from Mazatlan. So this was actually from a big town. But um, again, I think a beautiful pier here. And then we move down to stamp number three. This is the third of the first Hidalgo issue. This is a dos real, which is two reals. And what we see here is a, um, the district here is Campeche. Uh, and we see a small, like a treble clef almost. This was the town of Campeche too. This was the, we see a portion of that cancellation, but a beautiful green shade um, to distinguish from another green shade on the same stamp, the two real, the two, um, the two real, and this is actually the more scarce emerald shade. So there are so many shades to these stamps. When we put this right next to it, you can see kind of a yellow green and an emerald. So one can collect shades as well. Uh, and then we move to a slightly higher denomination stamp. This I believe is number four. And our district here is Guadalajara again, but we have a different town. We have Tepic, which is a small town, T-E-P-I-C, and we have a portion of the Tepic cancel. So what we've got is we've got the half real, we have the one real, we have the two real, and at the bottom here, we have got a couple um, interesting items here. What we have here is partial use of the stamp. 
This would be called fractional use of the stamp where somebody actually cut a two real or four real stamp in half to sh for half of the, um, the, the value. And that would be a shorter distance, but they didn't have the smaller denomination stamp. So this is what we would call is a portion of the stamp on piece with a lovely cancel. Um, here we have even a more unusual item. We have like a sixth or an eighth of a higher denomination stamp. And I think we've got a Zacatecas uh, cancellation here. Very rare and very interesting to find portions of a stamp used to create a certain value to mail a letter a certain distance. So this is just a, a sampling of the first issue, the Hidalgo issue. Um, none of these are terribly expensive. It's just a wonderful issue from a wonderful country. Mexico is a very important country, especially to American collectors. If you want to branch out past the United States, think about our neighbors, think about Canada, think about Mexico. Very important countries, important trading partners. We have so many people of Mexican heritage that have made their homes in the United States. It's a lovely country to collect. And classic Mexico is as good as any classic area in philately throughout the world. There are so many opportunities to go so many different ways, different districts, different town cancels, different plate positions. It's something that you'll really enjoy and it's not gonna cost you an arm and a leg. And I hope you'll think about collecting early Mexican stamps. Awesome, well, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you very much for having me. Hey, how you doing? I am well, thank you. So who are you and what do you have for us today? I am Paul Stanton from the Mouse and Such Stamp Company. And what do I collect, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. If you didn't exactly ask it, but that's okay. What I collect is something called Tonga Tin Can Mail. It comes from the kingdom of Tonga, specifically a small island in the South Pacific, which is actually nothing more than a volcano sticking straight up out of the water. As such, it has no harbor because everything comes straight up out of the water and the sides dip down sharply into the ocean, which tends to make a big problem for them to get deliverers to the island from the staff passing steamers which usually could only land when the water is calm about maybe twice a year. That was rather inconvenient for the one European guy working on the island. He would have liked to get mail to and from his family more often than twice a year, so he just, you know, he's still around, you know. So he tried to find a way that he could get mail in and out of this little island, which is called Neolofoten. First, they tried attaching it to rockets, firing at the island. That was a good idea, but sometimes the rockets got lost in the jungle and had to search for months, and sometimes they never found them. But sometimes he had a direct hit right into the thatched roof of someone's hut. And the ensuing fire did not make him popular with anybody. So he had to find a different way of doing it. He got the idea of sealing the mail in little biscuit tins giving it to a youngster who he paid all 25 cents equivalent to swim with this can out to a steaming passer, uh, a passing steamer and take the mail and they would throw him cans from the ship. I think sometimes they tried to hit him with the can, but that's another story. So he would grab those cans and he would swim back with the cans to the island. I mean, 25 cents for a two-mile swim in shark-infested frigid waters, how can you beat that? Well, then once one of the swimmer boys got his leg bitten off by a shark, and they weren't too happy continuing to do that, so they found a way to get little canoes to help them if they could actually launch and take it by canoe. That's why they call it Tin Can Canoe Mail. And they decided that it would be a great idea to go ahead and publicize this to the cruise lines so people would want to go on one of these specific cruises. I mean, let's face it, a cruise can be nice, but one part of the ocean looks just like the next. How much shuffleboard can you play? They wanted something to look forward to on that cruise, so they would go by this island, 
everyone on the ship was allowed three letters to address to somebody back home to brag that they were in the South Pacific on this cruise and use the cute little stamps from the island that no one back home had ever seen before. And of course it took six months for it to get home because it had to go to the island. They had to stamp it with all these cute little stamps and send it on its way on the next ship that came by a couple months later. It became very popular and they started taking out ads and all the newspapers around the world saying the famous tin can mail is going to be collected at the island on the next cruise, send your letters in. So people all over the world started doing it. They had to stop though, the shark didn't stop them. It stopped only in 1983 when they got a little airport on the island. So the poor little swimmer boys were out of a job. Now they get mail by air mail, but it's a fun thing to collect. I like to collect it because I'm also a stamp dealer and it's not good for me to steal stuff that my customers want to get to keep for my own. So I don't know any of my customers that collect this. I do and I have fun. Great, well thank you so much for sharing.